small branch retinal vein occlusion here, which is not seen in a, sorry, is not seen in the blue reflectance image. The vascular details are more markedly seen in a green reflectance image. The red reflectance image shows more details of the choroidal vessels and the RPE. So this is the multicolor imaging of an epiretinal membrane. This is the reflectance image. So in an ERM, this helps in better identification of the global area of involvement and also helps us in identifying the edge so that you can have a preoperative planning on where to start the pre peeling. Multicolor imaging helps us in better identification of macular edema, the especially diabetic macular edema. The blue reflectance image shows areas of cotton wool spots very clearly. The hard exudates, the hard exudates are seen with much more precision. So are the microaneurysms and hemorrhages, which are more clearly seen in the green reflectance image. The red reflectance imaging again shows the retinal pigment epithelial and choroidal details. In a proliferative diabetic retinopathy, multicolored imaging gives you a better identification of the neovascularization and surrounding traction. In a dry AMD, we know uh, reticular pseudotrusins are predecessors for a neovascular growth. So we need to identify them and a multicolor imaging picks up these lesions much better than a conventional uh, photography. You can see the target-like lesions in the multicolor imaging. Drusens are better made out. The margins are well defined for following up a case of dry AMD, multimodal imaging is of good value. So this uh, multicolor shows an area of uh, non-exudative CNVM, which the OCT angio really picks up. So you might get some clues by looking at the multicolor imaging to presence of a non-exudative CNVM as well. So this is a patient who has optic disc infarction following stenting of the carotid artery. So we see area of uh, optic disc edema, but a blue reflectance image shows a larger area of retinal edema along with optic disc edema. So Blue reflectance is definitely good for evaluating the anterior retinal findings. Multicolor imaging is sometimes helpful in a better understanding of the pathology. This patient came with a blunt trauma, has a scotoma. So one look at it, we make a diagnosis of a choroidal rupture. But when you look at the blue reflectance, green and red reflectance, we know that the area of pathology is more markedly seen in the blue reflectance imaging. If it was a pathology of the choroid, it should have been seen in the red reflectance image. So now we know it's an anterior retinal problem. So an octa is done, and you see that there is a rupture of the superficial and deep capillary plexus, along with an OCT showing a horizontal, I'm sorry, a vertical uh, cleavage plane at the anterior retinal surface. So this is a rare occurrence with a blunt trauma. This is an anterior retinal rupture in a blunt trauma rather than a choroidal rupture. This is an unhappy patient who came to me after a macular hole surgery done elsewhere. Vision was 6'9", but he's unhappy. Subtle changes in the retina is picked up better with multicolor imaging. You can see wedge-shaped retinal nerve fiber layer dissociated area seen called a DONFL. Ultra wide field imaging with a multicolor imaging. Any imaging which shows between 100 to 200 degree of field is ultra wide field imaging. Wide field imaging is from the posterior pole up till the equator or the vortex ampoule. So ultra wide field imaging helps us in diagnosing and documenting peripheral retinal lesions and also helping them in uh, helping us in following up cases. This is the case of peripheral retinal vasculitis which is followed up over three years and did very well with the mycophenolate muffet. Retro mode imaging is a new kid in the block and uh, we are still exploring the possibilities of that. It uses a scattered infrared light to detect abnormal reflections in the choroid and a three-dimensional image is created of a retro mode and this is a retro mode imaging of a RAP patient, RAP with sorry, 
RAP with uh, CNBN. You have, one has to be aware about artifacts in multicolor imaging, namely the central ghost spots and the pebble beach artifact. So it is faster. It can be done with a non-dilating pupil. Photophobic patient, you get a better image because it doesn't use light. Get a good clarity image in media opacities. Peripheral imaging is at its best with multicolor imaging. It has got better contrast. And lesions at the different level of the fundus are defined better. The demerits are it is expensive, need a little bit of training to take the image. And pseudo color and artifacts are something which has to be looked into. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shane. One question uh, actually uh, how often do you ask for multicolor image in your routine practice? Or clinically, how much it is useful? Uh, if you, you ask, ask me, for, yeah. yeah, if you ask me, my practice has changed massively after this came into my practice. I will quote a small example. I didn't have lack of time. I did not put that case to you. A patient underwent uh, retinal detachment surgery at elsewhere, came to me uh, 20 days post-op. Retina was attached. We all know retina was attached. Send him off. He came after three months with a recurrent retinal detachment. So he argued with me that, doctor, at that time you saw me, retina was detached. You did not find it out. Luckily, I had a peripheral fundus imaging of him, like an ultra-wide field image. I could show him and say that, see, it was attached at the time. So I have made it a part and parcel of my practice. So what happens is I have an imaging person who is taking pictures. When patient comes in, almost all, I make it a point to take. So uh, it has really changed the way I manage, uh, is what I would like to say. Thank you, Doctor. I now call upon Dr. Mahesh. He'll be talking to us on uh, monitoring OCT and OCT angiography in DME and AMD. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shane. Uh, this is a massive topic, in fact, uh, OCT and OCTA for DME and AMD. So I thought that this is a general ophthalmology crowd. Uh, we'll just go through some of the findings and some mistakes that we do while treating uh, DME and AMD with OCT. So uh, my first uh, message is don't treat any patient based on central macular thickness or central subfoveal thickness. And uh, especially if the clarity is not good. There are so many biomarkers or findings in OCT that will guide you. Like uh, in field, visual field, Humphrey field, uh, the, the glaucoma surgeons say that don't look at the grayscale and treat. So it's exactly the same, don't look at that uh, map and treat because there could be a lot of artifacts. That is message one. Number two, when you do an OCT, take all the sections and see. Do not forget which uh, uh, section is given in that. Uh, so all the sections you have to see. So finding may be a little away from the central area, especially in AMD. So you have to sit with the machine and uh, go, I mean, scroll little up and down and see the findings. So these are the two points that I want to make. So in DME, uh, there are different uh, types of findings, cystoid edema, spongiform edema, and serous detachment. Each one has little importance. We'll, I will come to that. Uh, and I will show some of the cases of biomarkers. So the, the, the classification is center non-involving uh, DME. Uh, these sort of cases, we always try to give laser if there are leaking microaneurysms. So this is a center non-involving. That you can see the central thickness is OK. It is just next to that. So this the standard treatment is focal laser. Now, spongiform edema. This is sponge life edema. In fact, it is present in 88% of cases. and. Uh, uh, this central macular thickness is important in the follow-up, but uh, uh, don't uh, treat just based on this. And this is cystoid edema. It, uh, this arrow mark shows cystoid edema. And this is serous macular detachment. And in fact, serous macular detachment, serous subfoveal detachment, SFD, or whatever you can call it, uh, they respond well to anti-VEGF injection. The visual outcome will be better. So that is one thing. And if there are, this is another important thing. I have seen n number of cases uh, with uh, uh, on treatment for injection when there is a taut posterior hyaloid or there is a ERM like picture, and that will not respond to your injections. How much of injections you give? That is important. So that has to be specifically looked for. And then you have to look for the hard X-ray. If there is a hard X-ray clump like this in the left side, the visual outcome may not be very good. 
and uh, the, uh, that has to be done. So, uh, and another thing is, if the vision uh, is out of proportion to the clinical findings, uh, you may think about ischemic macula. Here is the use for OCTA, OCTA, and uh, uh, OCTA shows uh, uh, that irregular foveal vascular zone uh, that is important in uh, treating. The outcome may be a little bad. Though another important thing is disorganized retinal inner layers. If you see which is a better eye, it doesn't, uh, left eye, left one looks better, but in fact, the left eye, the inner retinal layers are not at all visible, while in the right side, you can see all the ganglion cell, uh, uh, GCL, IPL layer, or everything. So, in fact, the right eye has a better prognosis. Like that, you have to look for the ELM and uh, uh, outer uh, ellipsoid line. If that is also intact, outcome is better. So, these are some of the findings. And then, when there is a lot of hard X-ray, like uh, the hyperreflective dots uh, inside a cyst or a subretinal space, there is a chance of clumping after your injection. So don't treat aggressively, treat slowly. Like this, it is pre-treatment, lot of uh, hyperreflective dots, it became clumped in the center. So that is an ellipsoid and ELM disruption, it gives poor prognosis. And uh, this is another case where octa is useful in DME. Uh, a patient had nephropathy, I couldn't do any uh, angiogram, dye angiogram, but definitely uh, the octa shows so this is one of the usefulness of uh, octa in DME. Now, coming to, so DME, do, never treat DME based on central macular thickness and look for biomarkers and modify your treatment. So that is all about DME, OCT, OCT, and DME. Now coming to AMD, <coughs> I will show some cases. This case, everyone knows this is a uh, AMD. And uh, in the OCT, you have to look at the different sections. If you see only the central section, there is some hyperreflective area just in front of the ellipsoid line. But in the lower sections, you can see that uh, 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 the feature suggestive of uh, uh, classic or uh, choroidal neovascular membrane. And uh, octa is showing a nice network there. And uh, post-treatment, you have to follow up section by section in the post-treatment and modify your treatment. Don't just look at one section. So this is post-treatment. So OCT and OCTA, both are very useful in uh, following up. And uh, OCTA shows that uh, regression after two or three injections. So this, both is, uh, both are useful in the follow-up of wet AMD. So this is another case. Uh, uh, if you see, this is called double layer sign. There is a, uh, that gap, uh, hyperreflective double layer sign. And uh, angiogram shows my leakage somewhere uh, once upon a time, we used to call it late leakage of undetermined souls. Uh, after treatment, this is uh, this was treated uh, some time back with uh, photodynamic therapy and intravital injection. Uh, it has become dry. So the follow-up of uh, uh, treatment, you have to look at each sections of uh, that uh, OCT and see whether there is any activity in any place like uh, uh, early intraretinal edema or hyperreflective dots, etc. This is another case. It looks, there was a, a teardrop sign like picture and there is fluid. These sort of cases, uh, our differential diagnosis is uh, atypical CSCR or pachycoroid disease like PCN. Here in Octa, you can see a network in a vascular slab, so that means that there is some PCN. So the difference is this may uh, work, uh, you can go for anti uh, aflibercept or some anti of injection. This is another one. <coughs> uh, this is a case of subfoveal polyp, in fact. Uh, one eye, left eye already has a scar, right eye has a thumb shape PED, and uh, 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 it was treated initially with the just, uh, I think, uh, one of these uh, anti of injections. There was no response, and this is uh, the uh, ICG showing a bunch of polyps in the center. And in fact, Octa, almost similar uh, uh, findings are seen as ICG. So Octa sometimes is as good as ICG in identifying some of the polyps. And uh, following uh, uh, full fluence full PDT with uh, injection, the patient gradually settled and is doing well. So this is post-treatment, uh, post-PDT, uh, the, uh, the polyp has regressed to, uh, this is left one is pre and right one is pre post. So this uh, octa and OCT are very useful in the follow-up. Over, okay. So this is a wrap case. One minute is there. Right, uh, this is a uh, tra uh, rac uh, trapezoid PED with intraretinal edema, classic finding of a wrap with a uh, uh, trapdoor sign or uh, erosion. And that is uh, the yellow arrow shows the erosion. And uh, 
uh, angiogram shows a hyperplaquid dot uh, in the center of the PED. And uh, uh, post treatment, uh, you can monitor the uh, uh, findings with uh, OCT. So, this is uh, some pre treatment and post treatment finding. So, these are all OCT biomarkers that you have to look for specifically in a case of AMD. All this, not only central macular thickness. Now, a lot of people are treating with just uh, central macular thickness uh, with injections. And there are a lot of, uh, that is why I wanted to highlight these findings. When you look for the, uh, one of these findings and then follow up with the same way, you can, uh, you cannot miss anything. So, this is another PED, a lot of uh, variations of PED are there. And uh, each one has a diagnostic implication, I mean, a treatment management implication. So, that is another thing. And uh, Okta has helped us. Uh, these are all different types of uh, uh, networks seen in uh, uh, Okta. And uh, now we are learning more and more about Okta in the, uh, and we have identified, as Shane showed, showed, silent network. Without any fluid, Okta is identifying silent ne network like this, which is also, which will also tell you that the, the, likely to, the patient is likely to develop wet AMD. So, these are all different patterns seen in Okta. So, and uh, post-treatment, Okta is a very useful tool uh, to follow up the AMD cases. And uh, this is another one, type uh, 2 CNVM, where there is a dense uh, network here. So, this is post-treatment. You can see pre-treatment and post-treatment in monitoring. So, both these things are very useful. This is another wrap and pre-treatment and post-treatment. How that uh, network has uh, reduced and become mature vessel. So, these are all some of the findings. So, take home message, invasive dye angiography can be replaced to a great extent by OCT, OCT a combination. But you should spend some time with the machine looking at the sections and biomarkers. Single printout treatment is not advisable. Thank you for the kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh, for that lucid talk. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, uh, how do you incorporate OCT in your follow-up schedule for... Uh, AMD. Do you do it at every visit after looking at the OCT or is it mandatory you do the OCT and the OCTA for uh, every follow-up visit? Yeah, actually in our uh, hospital uh, the fellows are doing, not technician. So we have given a protocol like uh, if it is wet AMD or PCV, we do multimodal imaging in the initial visit and the follow-up is with OCT, OCTA and they will look through the same sections. That is how one of the advantages. If the technician may not, may miss some areas. So we all follow up OCT, OCTA we are doing. This is our pattern. That's a very uh, strong and robust practice. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, invite Dr. Risha to give her uh, talk on uh, the use of angiography and autofluorescence in UVATIC entities. Dr. Risha, please. Good morning. First, let me thank Dr. Shane and Dr. Sudarshan for giving me this proxy opportunity. I'll be dealing with the angiography and uh, autofluorescence in uh, uveitis conditions. Okay. Okay. As we all know, ancillary investigations are the backbone of UVITIS workup. They help in making the diagnosis, ruling out certain differential diagnosis, and also helps in monitoring inflammation during follow-up. FFA helps to analyze blood flow in retinal vessels and also detect inflammation of vessels. It detects uh, uh, in, in neovascularization. It gives information regarding RPE and choreocapillaries. It also gives an idea about the optic disc condition. Here, this is an example of occlusive vasculitis. FFA gives complete idea about the extent of vasculitis and about the ischemic status of the retina. case of uh, serpiginous choroiditis, FFA gives the complete extent of the choroiditis and it also gives an idea about the RPE status which gives the prognosis of the condition. 
In APM PPE, FFA shows early hypo and late hyperfluorescence. And uh, you can see in FFA the number of lesions are much more than in a fundus photo. In Eels disease, in the active vasculitis phase, early venous phase shows staining of veins with extravasation of dye in the late phase. We can classify, we can, uh, st classify into different stages according to FFA into active vasculitis phase, ischemic phase and neovascularization phase. FFA gives an idea about the stage of the disease. And after treatment, uh, the active vasculitis become a uh, healed lesion and it, uh, it stain without any extravasation. So it helps in following up a patient with treatment. And it also helps in detecting certain conditions like in Bayset, FFA shows the typical vasculitis patch. Thus it helps in diagnosing certain uveitis conditions. In VKH also, the typical FFA pattern is seen here, pinpoint early hyperfluorescence with late, hyper, late pooling in the subregional space. So these typical patterns helps in the diagnosis. In posterior scleritis also, there will be pinpoint leaks with uh, disc leak. So FFA helps in differentiating some conditions. It uh, helps in uh, detecting early complications like CNVM. Sometimes may be mistaken as an act reactivation of an old scar. So FFA helps in detecting this early changes of CNVM and also CME associated with an chronic intermediate or posterior uveitis. A word about OCT angiography, it's a non-invasive depth resolved on fast images of retinal capillary networks. It, uh, is, uh, FFA is still essential for uh, detecting vascular leakage and detecting peripheral ischemia and neovascularization. This is a picture of uh, Besset uh, Octa. Uh, we can uh, differentiate superficial and capilla superficial capillary plexus and deep capillary plexus changes separately. In choroidal uh, inflammatory conditions, FFA detect choriocapillary vo uh, flow voids and uh, early inflammatory CNVM changes. Now comes uh, fundus autofluorescence. It's an in vivo imaging method for metabolic mapping of naturally or pathologically occurring fluorophores of the ocular fundus. This is the uh, normal autofluorescence picture. The amount of autofluorescence depends on the amount of fluorophores. Again, depends on the phase of inflammation. So in the active phase, it will be hyper autofluorescent due to increased uh, fluorophores and uh, in healed stage it will be totally hypo autofluorescent. Uh, this is a picture of uh, active toxoretinochoroiditis. In the active phase you can see an amorphous pattern of uh, hyper autofluorescence and as the lesion heals it become more and more hypo and when it heals completely it become jet black. And it also helps in detecting early reactivation of an toxos lesion. Similarly, uh, so the pattern of healing is described as amorphous pattern of uh, hyper and a ring pattern of hyper and hypo autofluorescence and a trophic pattern of uh, hypo autofluorescence. Similarly, in uh, serpiginous choroiditis, it uh, helps in detecting early reactivation of an old lesion. It appears as a ring uh, pattern of hyper autofluorescence at the edges of the old lesion. 
and as the lesion heals it become uh, more and more hypo and when it uh, heals completely it become totally hypo autofluorescent So the take-home message is uh, uh, fundus fluorescein angiography and FFA octa helps not only in making correct diagnosis but also helps in documenting and following up patients following therapy in a UVIT conditions. Thank you. Very nice talk. I just wanted to know, are you using OCT more often now to make a differential diagnosis as to what is the cause of a coronoitis or how to proceed further? Do you use OCT as a diagnostic thing? Uh, sometimes no, in uh, retinochoroiditis toxo conditions, uh, it helps in detecting the status of retinitis and choroiditis. Helps you to know cases. whether you are dealing with the retinitis uh, um, or only retinitis, retinochoroiditis, or a purely a choroiditis. So that helps you in making an etiological uh, diagnosis. In uh, the ruling out certain differential diagnosis. Have you ever experienced that this can help you, and you need not do the serum biomarkers then, or you still depend on the serum biomarkers? Still, still depends depend on, on serum biomarkers. Okay. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Parveen Sen. She is a consultant vitreoretinal surgeon at uh, Agarwal's Eye Hospital, Chandigarh. Um, it's a mystery for all of us uh, in retinal dystrophies, uh, especially the electrophysiology. Madam will make it very lucid for us. Thank you, Shane, for the invite and the, and the introduction. So I really hope I'm able to make it lucid for you. That is the aim. Yeah, so uh, I'll be talking on electrophysiology and multimodal imaging put together for retinal dystrophies. So why should most of us have this first question is why should we doing, be doing any investigation whatsoever for uh, uh, retinal dystrophies because uh, there is no treatment. But it does help in uh, making a diagnosis, helps in targeted genotyping, helps in making a prognosis and explaining it to the patient for better understanding of disease. And in few situations, you may actually identify the underlying gene defect and I will take you through this step by step without uh, overwhelming all of you. So the first and the most common symptom that you may come across uh, with the patient of retinal dystrophy is night blindness. So this is the picture that you will have of a patient who complains night blindness. It may be an absolutely normal fundus or it may be stippled uh, pigmentation. So if you do an ERG, you have a normal fundus and a negative waveform your diagnosis is going to be congenital stationary night blindness. If you have this kind of a bony spicule pigmentation and your ERG is flat, then you can make a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. If you have this tepetal reflex and a negative ERG on a combined response, you can make a diagnosis of Aguchi. Night blindness, white spots on the fundus, and a reduced response which in becomes better on prolonged uh, adaptation is going to be fundus albivunctatus. Second thing which you more commonly see is negative ERG. So without going too much into detail, negative ERG means you are getting a good A wave but not getting a good B wave. So here if you have a foveal schesis with negative ERG, it is X-linked retinoschesis. If you have lots of hemorrhages and you do an ERG and you see a negative waveform, it is central retinal veil occlusion. If you see a foreign body and you see a negative wave, this could be a beginning of sidrosis. Another common thing is lots of white dots on the retina. So if you, moment you see white dots, you should definitely ask for an ERG. If you see white dots and you see a normal ERG, it is benign fleck retina syndrome. 
If you see white dots and you see a reduced uh, uh, scotopic response, predominantly it is fundus albi punctatus, and if you see white dots and a flat ERG, it is retinitis punctata albicans. So this is how you image it and you do your ERGs, but sometimes you don't get an answer all the time on just a photograph. So you see white dots, but more or less the ERGs are looking similar. You do an FFA and you see that the fundus on the right has these well-defined areas of choriocapillaris loss, and on the left is plenty of flex. So here, the, f the first case the on the left is your Betis crystalline dystrophy, and on the right is fundus flavimaculatus. So the imaging and ERG put together actually gives you the diagnosis. Near normal looking fundus, some yellowish flecks at the macula, ERG is normal, multifocal ERG is down, and this is Stargardt's disease. Near normal looking fundus, and you see that your uh, ERG is a normal, multifocal ERG is down, but you see how much are the flecks on FFA. So this is fundus flavimaculatus. Again, similar looking fundus, and you don't know what you're looking at, but ERG is almost extinguished. So here you're looking at a cone rod dystrophy. Similar, doesn't tell you the story, a near normal looking fundus, but you see you do a multimodal imaging along with electrophysiology and go back to your history and the patient is having hydroxychloroquine toxicity. So no single test gives you all the answers, but if you combine it very usefully with your knowledge of electrophysiology, you can answer a lot of these uh, mysteries. Taking you to this spectrum of uh, best one mutations, which is not often discussed, so you can have a well-defined macular lesion, and if you don't know what it is, you suspect it's a bilaterally symmetrical disease, you do an ERG, which is normal, multifocal is slightly subnormal in the center, and you see EOG is markedly down, you know it is uh, vitelliform disease. Here, this is also a best one mutation, but you have a foveoschisis in the center on OCT, yellowish dots in the annular area around the arcades, and you have an ERG which is slightly subnormal, EOG which is markedly down. This is autosomal recessive best rhinopathy. This is uh, bilaterally symmetrical, patient is older, around 50s, may be referred to you as having AMD, and then you do your OCTs, you do your ERGs, and you know it is a non-progressive adult onset vitelliform disease. So this is how you do your OCT and your OCTA, looking for a CNVM, but there is none, because this is adult vitelliform disease, and it is not uh, AMD. Adveric is a rare form of disease where you can have a markedly reduced rod and cone responses, even in the presence of best one mutation. Just a couple of slides on congenital station night blindness, near normal looking fundus you see here, and a typical uh, normal OCT, and you have a typical beautiful negative waveform. Only A wave is present, no B wave, photopic otherwise is normal. This is congenital stationary night blindness. You have this tepetal reflex, and you have a negative waveform. This is Aguchi disease. You cannot miss this one if you have an optos. So this is some beautiful phenotyping which leaves you with no doubt as to your diagnosis. So what about reaching which is the underlying gene? Can we do that? So in some uh, inherited retinal disorders which are caused by a single gene, you can actually do it. As I showed you with XLRS, you know that the underlying gene defect is RS1, so you actually need not under they ask the patient to undergo any genetic testing. Another test which I found very useful in XLRS is this. If you see beautifully, this is the fundus autofluorescence compared with this fundus photograph. So if you see, I don't have a pointer here, but the area of schesis corresponds to the area of hypoautofluorescence. So if you cannot clinically pick up where is your uh, split, you just have to do an FAF and that's it. You know it exactly where the split is. So this is how it helped me. So the young patient and you, I saw marked loss of uh, vision, but I didn't think that there was a split, but actually the split had happened and uh, already the area was totally atrophic. And this is the corresponding ERG. If you see the ERG on the left-hand side, 
the amplitudes of the negative waveform are even lesser as compared to the right. So it is helping you prognosticate as well. So if your amplitudes are lesser, it means the disease is worse. Another example, you can see the area split very nicely on a fundus autofluorescence. And if you see on autofluorescence, there is some area, dark area at the macula also. So when I did the OCT, you could see that the macula was also involved in the split. And we, this is the other eye of the same patient, and I did not do anything for the patient because it was not retinal detachment which has caused the uh, drop in vision, but that the split was involving the fovea, and on the left-hand side, there's a complete loss of ellipsoid because, again, though you don't see the split, but it has already happened there, and this is degeneration following the split. Another example, enhanced s dystrophy, typical fundus features of an annular uh, uh, either annular ring of pigmentation or annular yellow spots or annular uh, subretinal fibrosis. This is typical of enhanced S cone. And if you do the ERG, enhanced S cone means there is a total loss of cones. There are three types of cones, L, M, and S. So in this disease, L and M cones are absent, S cones are present, S cones behave more like rods so the photopic and scotopic ERGs look identical and this can be caused only by the NR2E3 gene so by doing a phenotyping you know what is the genetic defect typical example patient comes to you with cone dystrophy a bullseye maculopathy you get a ERG done thinking that you will see flat responses here the photopics are flat but look at what's happening to the rods they are higher in amplitude. Flat cones, high rods is only because of the KCNV2 gene. So ERG and phenotyping is telling you the genetic story. Another example of the same one, bullseye maculopathy, flat cones, very high rods, and this is KCNV2. Retinitis pigmentosa, just one or two slides. It can be caused by more than 100 genes. We call this atypical. This is not atypical RP. This is typical RP, behaves like RP, symptoms of RP, extinguished responses, only the clinical picture is like that of these widespread peripheral uh, uh, CRA marks. But this is because the circle mutation presents like this. And most common mutation causing RP in India is circle. So this is not atypical. Again, RDH12 may present like this and not with peripheral bony uh, spicules. So this is still RP. ABCA4 may present like this with central involvement. This is not atypical. It is just that it is ABCA4 causing RP. And it may not be extinguished. That's because actually the peripheral retina, if you see, is still pink, which means some amounts of cells are still working, even though the loss is vision is huge. So this is uh, PRPF31, which gives you CME. And this is the knowledge of this helped me diagnose this patient. Patient came to me with a history of uh, drop in, recent drop in vision, 54-year-old, diagnosed to have macular hole, and came for macular hole surgery. But I saw these on OCT itself. I saw these well-defined round lesions. And this made me think whether it was a milder form of RP. We got the genetic testing done. ERG was also slightly less. And the genetic testing showed us PRPF6 mutation, which is an autosomal dominant form of RP, which is a mild disease, which explains why the patient had a presentation much later in life. So knowledge of ERG, you may not become an electrophysiologist by knowing it, but one more test will definitely help you in making many more diagnoses. I, thank you, Dr. Parvin. I have one question. We had a couple of uh, uh, RD surgeries, post-RD surgery. Uh, one was a buckle, other one was vitrectomy oil, oil removal. Patient did not improve at all uh, in spite of nice attached retina. The whole retina ellipsoid was white field, ellipsoid was lost. Other eye, we did autofluorescence, little suppression, the, I mean, the waves are little down, not extinguished. And some autofluorescence uh, changes were there. We could not, uh, I mean, any, any <laughs> possibility. I think some kind of toxicity also may have happened. Maybe he's all on some medication for a long period of time, which is specifically caused ellipsoid loss. The whole so that is history ellipsoid has... was lost. 
So if it is there on the other eye also, then it's a bilateral condition, then you have to think whether some we could not get into medical any <laughs> yeah. uh, cause of it, the medicines or some kind of toxicity which has caused it. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so the no now the next talk is uh, demystifying few macular mysteries with uh, multimodal imaging by Dr. Unnikrishnan, who is the managing director of Chaitanya Group of Institutions. So thank you for the invite, Shane. So I'm just going to keep this uh, talk extremely light and partially non-relevant also, but yeah. So retinal imaging, uh, sometimes we believe certain factors and features and we believe certain truths, but sometimes you get popped up with a lot of surprises. So this is just a fun collection of things. So we just start looking at some macular holes. So sometimes when you say the macular ho hole closed, you have to eat your own words because uh, they don't uh, behave well like you want to. This is a macular hole with a VMT attachment and uh, we were offering uh, surgery for the patient. The patient didn't have surgery. Subsequently, the patient developed a CNVM. And without surgery itself, the macular hole uh, closed because of the fibrotic reaction that happened. After some time, this patient uh, had a bleed. The bleed went through the macular hole and the VMT, the uh, vitreomacular traction got relieved. So spontaneously, when you tell a patient that you have to do surgery, things like this can happen in your practice. I had a pediatric surgeon who, uh, who knew everything more about macular holes than I did. So we did a, mac a macular hole surgery for him. He started with 660. I told him, you will not have uh, an improvement in vision. So this was post-operative. It looked uh, very nice. And after some time, you can see uh, there was a small area of foveal atrophy happening. At this point of time, his vision had improved to 636. After a couple of months, his, his RP atrophy increased, and now his vision is 612. And this is after about a year. There's a huge area of macular uh, RP atrophy, and he has got a 66 vision at present. So sometimes you have very lucky things happening, and uh, because he's a pediatric surgeon, he probably uh, thanked me without me doing anything. We had another patient, uh, and sometimes you just do a macular hole surgery, and you pray that it closes. So I prayed very hard for this patient. This patient had a macular hole and the macular hole closed, but after a couple of months, this started happening. It started closing too well. We had content inside and it started sprouting out. So uh, after a couple of, so this is a gliotic reaction and could, for lack of a better word, you can call it a retinal keloid. Can we call it a retinal keloid? So this is what happened for this particular patient. There are many, many theories of macular hole closure. That is, you relieve the tangential traction, uh, re remove the pull, um, there's a Muller cell. But one of the most fascinating is the astronaut inside the eye. And I call this the astronaut. It's like a man holding the two edges of the macular hole together. So this is the ILM flap, which causes a, a closure. So uh, Shira is looking. She's the one who worked off this case <laughs> patient for me. And we called it the astronaut closing the macular hole. Membranes. So you have uh, different looking membranes. So this particular picture is very interesting. It's a very sh uh, subtle membrane. And uh, I was looking at the net, and I found that it exactly looks like the war memorial in Japan, the Iwo Jima war memorial. Uh, it's called, uh, this war memorial is for the World War II pi uh, pilots in uh, Japan. And then you have the mess. This looks like an ERM, but trust me, this patient cannot be touched surgically. This is a case of a combined hematoma. It looks like it. Uh, Vitreotone surgeons have itching hands because they want to try peeling this. Uh, along with the ERM, you will peel the retina, 50% uh, of the retina also if you touch this patient probably. So this is a combined hematoma. So let's go to the next section. This is called the flight of the headless chicken. So this is a particular patient in which this is a very short duration. Uh, so there was a cystoid, it's a, a, a diagnosis, a DME type lesion. And then they had this thing, and inside, if you look at it, this is the headless chicken appearance I was talking about. There's a small uh, circle inside the cyst which looks like fibrin, and there's an outline. And this particular patient, when we did the rest, we found another diagnosis. This is a patient with PAM. And you can see the ferning inside the, uh, the, ferning inside the uh, NFAS imaging, and you can see on these two sides of the the middle layers are uh, hyperreflective. This is uh, an angiography which was done for this patient, and there are a few very interesting uh, findings that we found out in this. One being that there was a very 
pulsatile looking uh, lesion happening, pulsating throughout. So uh, this particular patient with an ischemic retina with a pulsatile lesion over here, and suddenly multimodal imaging causes more confusion. And this was a diagnosis we had actually made of uh, something like a PVAC, uh, a PVAC that is a, a peripheral exudative vascular abnormalness complex, big names. But an exudative component, uh, an ischemic component all happening for this patient. Another patient which is quite interesting is that we had a look at one eye and made a diagnosis of a choroidal osteoma. Uh, it looked, uh, some of the features looked like that. On uh, the right eye, you can see it developed a CNVM. The left eye was relatively okay. This was how the picture looked. Uh, we, uh, on uh, autofluorescence, um, it's a, now looking back, it's a pretty typical diagnosis, but we'll go to, come to that later. So the OCT, uh, the ICG, the FFA, all yielded an intense amount of staining at that area, uh, lack of RP, and then you have uh, CNVM. So when we started treating the CNVM, something happened. That is the time between the injections, the size of the CNVM started increasing rapidly with many, many folds of uh, tissue. And this is what happened over time. And then it started one day the RP just broke on top of it and there was a huge cystoid macular edema and you can see the thickness and then we saw a slight lesion and it looked like a haversian canal and we thought this was a choroidal ostomia. We did all the investigations outside the eye, we couldn't find calcification, uh, it was an enlarged uh, blind spot and the ERG showed a, a scotopic uh, defect. And finally, when we look back at it, it looked like an azure-type complex. And if you look at the uh, autofluorescence early, there was a trizonal appearance. Uh, the presence of a CNVM in azure, there are only two or three reported cases. So it's quite interesting how this patient unfolded. The area I've shown is a new area of CNVM developing, and the vessel started increasing in size. Just to bring a few angiographic uh, uh, pictures and uh, interesting things, so this is This is a picture where you can see there's a pulsatile, the whole uh, posterior pole, there's a pulsatile area and the pulsatile of the hyperreflective, uh, what do you say, hyperpermeable area. This, I'll skip this, I'm sorry. This is an interesting patient which has, you can, I mean, just, just for the interest of the dynamic angiography, he has got a severe amount of ischemia and you can see this small vessel pushing, 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 trying to push blood into the, uh, this is the circulation. So please look at this vessel. It's been trying for about a couple of 30 seconds, trying to push blood into the rest of the, uh, the circulation. And you can see slowly the blood column increasing. And this is the beauty of uh, dynamic uh, angiography and imaging. Now you can see it's slowly increasing uh, to increase the circulation to the rest of the areas. So, and this is a phenomenally amazing patient in which uh, I just wanted to see what happens in this patient. Uh, you can see what we have learned, the arteries fill first, the veins fill second. Here the arteries fill, the veins fill, the veins empty, and the uh, veins fill again. So there's a, it's like a spasm happened in between. You can just look at the veins. Suddenly you see the veins are filling, and after some time the whole circulation blanks once, and then it comes back. So the, on examination for this, you can see it blanking now, and it's coming back. On, uh, on evaluation, uh, we found a diagnosis of uh, vasospastic spinal. This was a Raynaud's with SLE type uh, patient, uh, Raynaud's retinal vasospasm. So this particular patient is quite interesting. Uh, why? Because this was what the angiography looked like. There's a lot of leakage on angiography in the posterior pole, but the, uh, the ICG doesn't show any problems, which ruled out a, uh, an inflammatory disease. But there is absolutely no leakage on the OCT. So you have leakage on the uh, fluorescent, but no leakage on the OCT. This is quite stunning. I've, uh, Dr. Parveenson also helped me with this patient. And this is what we found out. The patient had NVI. There was no radial pulse, had three MIs, and a history of Raynaud's. This was a Takayasu arthritis uh, with an ophthalmic, slow ophthalmic artery uh, occlusion happening in this patient. And one of the last patients I'd like to show you is this particular patient with uh, macular telangiectasia. You can see a vessel on the surface. And when you did uh, an FFA for this patient, this patient had uh, PDR. So it's a very interesting patient uh, of a, a case of a new concept of epiretinal neovascularization in MACTEL, where the retinal circulation grows into the and attaches to the macular telangiectasic vessels. So this is a very interesting patient which had uh, uh, an ischemia which connected to the macular telangiectasia. 
So spectacularly man-made lesions. Okay, so you can see these, you can see these small dots which were carefully installed there during PFCL injection of this patient. Through the macular hole it went inside, sat over there. So these are beautiful man-made circular lesions, not PEDs. And uh, these are some of the lesions you can see in the color photo. You don't see anything but the multicolor. You see something. This is a choroidal uh, nevus happening. You see this beautiful picture of a pigmented lesion. This is picture is courtesy of Dr. Manoj. But sometimes when you use other modalities, it disappears in a multicolor. So be careful of multimodal imaging sometimes. It doesn't give you uh, what you expect sometimes. So thank you for the uh, listening. Hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Dr. Unni, for elevating the mood to the next level. <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, images, though. Uh, due to lack of time, we don't uh, need to discuss any further. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Risha, Dr. Parveen Sen, and Dr. Unni Krishnan for being in this. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and take home some messages. Thank you.